The following program contains archived content. Some of the information may now be out of date. Welcome everybody to my podcast, Big Little Small Talk. I'm Megan O'Hara Sullivan and I love to talk, but I also love to listen. If you're new here, welcome. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome along to my segment called Big Little Small Talk, where I get to go out into the community and interview someone interesting. Now, I've always found this woman completely interesting for lots and lots of reasons, and I think you will too. So my guest today on Big Little Small Talk is Marilyn Strofield, and she is the CEO of an organisation called the Primary Health Network. Now, Marilyn, welcome along, and thank you for having me here in your beautiful home. Thanks, Megan. It's lovely to have you. So describe where we are. Where do you live? And what's, what does it look like when you look out the window? So I live on, I live on 43 acres on the side of Mount Mola, which overlooks Clifton, and it's in between the Nobby Pub and the Clifton pubs, <laughs> so it's sort of halfway. Right, it's still a drive to, to one of them. But I had, as another guest on my segment, I had Keith Banger a, a little while ago uh, from the Lone Eagle Flying School and he was a really interesting guest because he had an, a lady there who was learning to fly and she was a woman, I think, maybe in her 60s and she told me all about how it had been this desire for her and Keith talked about um, Trevor, Trevor Banger, I beg your pardon, to, um, uh, uh, the scholarships that they offer for the local people um, to come and learn to fly. So have you ever been flying from the Lone well, Eagle Flying School? Well, I school? haven't, but um, surprisingly, Trevor's son, James, was the builder who redesigned our house for us when we moved in. And James has done a beautiful job from the time we bought the place he would fly over it and take photos for us. So I've got all these beautiful aerial photos of our farm, thanks to James Banger. That's a nice nice circle. But you haven't always lived in this area, have you? You've come back here because why? Well, we we came to Toowoomba in about 2000 with our children. Um, My husband was a detective with Queensland Police and we wanted a place that had great schools. So at that time, our daughter was about to go into grade eight. So we found Fair Home for her and we found Grandma for our son. And it was the best decision we ever made. It was a lovely place for them to, to grow into to teenagerhood. Mm-hmm. And um, when, when we were ready, when the kids had gone off to university, we went back to Brisbane and uh, I spent 10 years there as an executive with the Queensland government and... Um, we always thought we would love to come back to Toowoomba to retire. So four years ago, my husband got a transfer back here. And at that point, I was just going to commute back to Brisbane. But this great CEO job came up with the Primary Health Network. And here we are four years later. Yes, I, I was under the impression that your husband had grown up in the Clifton district. Was that right? No, no. 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 He actually grew up in Charters Towers. Okay. Yeah. And you didn't have a connection to the area We didn't. Either. No, we just, we knew we wanted to buy acreage and we had a look around and um, just decided that this was a beautiful place to live. But interestingly, since we've moved here, we found that my husband's great-grandmother was actually born in Nobby. <laughs> So one of the Fram family, so which is a local family, and um, yeah, so that's just been an interesting connection. Right, isn't that mm. bizarre? Well, I know uh, Rod Fram had a business in Clifton for a long yeah, time, yeah. and sort of tragically died quite early in his life as a younger man. Um, so that would have been some of his relatives, and you yes, didn't realise. Yeah, that. and and I I knew that my uncle um had been principal of Greenmount Primary School. You know, back in the 60s or whatever, and my great uncle Walter, who'd been injured in World War One, lived with my aunt and uncle at Greenmount. And so I always knew that there was this sort of family connection with Greenmount mm. as well. And was that, um, do you think for you guys, um, you had a desire to live in the country for any reason? Like, yeah, look, it, it was it was it was a toss up between do we retire by the beach mm. because we love that as well, but we we both come from families who have had a lot to do with cattle and farming, and um, we just that won out in the end. 
we just wanted a little place where we could raise a few cows and you know just have a bit of space to enjoy ourselves and and that's what we've got have a garden and grow some roses as oh, i look out the window beautiful. i see your beautiful roses clifton grows the best roses ever the black yes. soil is it yes. black soil oh, here I, on I the side well of they mountain thrive mountain? on neglect here so <laughs> <laughs> it's something yeah, it must be the soil that's, yeah. that's the secret now you may have mentioned before that you had had a government job i think you were kind of more than a government job really i think when you're the de- Deputy Director General for the Queensland Department of Communities, Child Safety and Disability Services. Yeah. It's not just, you're not just a pencil pusher, hey. Tell no. me about that job and um, what that was like to work at that high level and doing that sort of work. Well, look, it was a great privilege, you know, to, to work in that job. And part of what I did was, you know, I had statewide responsibility for about 5,000 public servants, you know, very special people who who work with children in need and then, you know, work in disability services and part of community services was also community recovery. So we did, we helped people after disasters to get back on their feet. Um, I looked after schoolies down on the Gold Coast. (laughs) It was a wide portfolio (laughs) and the Office for Women, which was really about, you know, trying to get better representation for women in leadership positions and on government boards, etc. But I have to say, um, the time that I had working with child protection was, you know, some of the most meaningful work I'd done. It was, it was, it was a real privilege to be able to make policy about, you know, how we, how we, a stopped children being hurt in the first place, but b made sure that they had a safe place to go if if they had been in a situation where they'd been hurt. Mm. So talk to me about. Um the age of criminal responsibility and about um, that children just need a good kick up the bum and that's that mm. you know that they they're, mm. they're not getting treated um, they're, they're just getting a slap on the wrist mm. and um, they're getting away with murder these days Look, it, it's it's something I've had a lot of time to think about um, in Queensland basically you have to be 10 to be able to commit a crime and to be found culpable for that crime, below 10, you, you can't be. So basically, if you c- commit a crime that's serious enough from age 10 up, you can end up in basically a children's prison. Mm. So we don't, we don't want that for our children, but it, it's a very vexed question because often these children grow up you know, we, we talk about intergenerational trauma, but often, you know, they've never had role models or, or parents that have shown them love and affection. They often have a disability. They often have mental health problems. Um, when you've got over-representation of Aboriginal adults in the prison system, they, those people have children and those children are left without parents. And there's a whole lot of things that contribute, you know, to, to some of this behaviour. And I, I'm always amused because I started my uh, professional career as a speech pathologist. And the thing that I was really interested in was acquired brain injury and how brains work. And even you'll hear educators talk about these children, they'll talk about choice theory from when children are very small that... You know, they just have to make the right choices. They have to choose not to behave in a particular way. Well, I think that's bunkum because children's brains, they they are not developed enough so they can stop and regulate their behaviour. Like, that doesn't happen really till young men are around 25. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why they indulge in risk-taking behaviour. They make silly decisions. So to tell a child to, you've just got to stop and make a, a better decision, it's not going to happen. So we've got to make sure that, that these children are given some parameters and boundaries and rules um, and that they're assisted to work within those rules. Um, and, and they've got to be shown, they've got to be shown how to do some things because they've never been shown how to do things. So are you... 
I mean, when you say they need to be shown that, is that by children um, being assisted to stay in their families and working with the parents? Is that the answer? Is it, I mean, is it really at the end of the day, it just comes down to there's not enough money, there's not enough money in the system or what is it, do you think? There's Are we enough... going backwards? We're going forwards? We're making Look, uh, gains? You or... know, I think we make, I think it's like three steps forward, two steps backward. Ideally, you want children to stay with their family because whatever families do to children, children still love their parents and they go through a grieving process when they're taken away from their parents. So we want to make, you know, where possible, we want to support those families to be able to look after their children. We had a beautiful little program when I was in government and it was with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young mums. They'd never been shown how to tuck their children into bed at night, never been shown to read them a story. You know, you know how you settle children down and get them to quieten down? Never been shown how to do that. So they actually had aunties who went into the houses and just showed them, just read them a story, you know, give them a kiss, walk out, mm. leave them. And, and it, it was a great program, but it was a pilot program and it wasn't refunded. But they're the sorts of mm. things that, mm. that we could be doing to And help. it's the biggest problem um, with all agencies and um, uh, the community groups that not the community groups, the groups that sort of, they, they, they run on funding and then the funding runs out and then that program stops and that lack of continuity, do you think? Or You know, I don't think that's a huge problem because a lot of the big agencies, they just get ongoing funding from the government. Right. I think part of the issue is making sure that that's targeted where it needs to be and that requires, you know, a lot of... Um, a lot of observation of how those funds are being spent and then some evaluation. Like, are the kids any better off because you spent that money? Mm -hmm. like that's the basic yep. question that you want to answer. Mm -hmm. So how long did you spend in that? Like, I suppose your career was probably progressing, was it? And, um, yeah, yeah. Look, I had 10 years with Queensland Government. Um, prior to that, I was with the Australian Government. And um, 10 years in that field, mm. so disability services, mm. community services. Mm -hmm. And youth mental health, I think, is yes. one of your passions, is. is that right? I Absolutely. suppose that's can, can, uh, all co-joined with all of the things that you were talking about yes. before. Yeah. yeah. Look, we have too many kids who hurt themselves and, and even worse. And um, we that, that shouldn't be tolerated by anybody in... Mm -hmm. You know, we've got cyberbullying, we've got uh, kids with eating disorders. There's a whole heap of things and it seems to me that unless you're very, very unwell, it's really difficult to get services and we need to be working with children, you know, from the time they start to become unwell. So they're given uh, coping strategies, they're taught how to be resilient how to reframe things, you know, to, so it's not as catastrophic as they may have thought it was. Um, and also, you know, some, some children will need medication and that's okay because some, some children just have some deficiencies in some of their biochemicals and, mm. you know, just as you would for any other illness... You might need some medicine for and that. And how are how are these children accessing services? If they're you know, there's so much pressure put on educators, and um, they everyone says oh they should be taught at school to to do this, and there's always um, you know from learning how to drive to cooking classes to everything that is being now put on teachers in mm. terms of teaching kids to do things like how do how do parents access those sort of services? Where do they go to? Where would, if you were a parent out there right now and you thought, oh, my child is just giving me such a hard time and I know he's unhappy and he won't go to the doctor, I, don't, I just don't know what to do, what would they do? Well, you know, this is a really, that's a really good question because uh, we, we as, as the Primary Health Network, we fund a number of youth mental health services. But if you go into a community and ask those parents, do you know where you can get help? They'll say, no, I haven't got a clue. 
So we funded mental health navigators um, based in you know various communities, and and they should be the first port of call. Is this a person? A it role? It is a person. Right. Yeah. yeah, it's a person who knows what's available in that local community and where you can get help. We also have a lot of telehealth services now too, so people actually don't have to physically go in to see a therapist. But a lot of if if a person wants free services. A lot of the times they'll have to go to their GP first because they need a GP approved mental health plan. Mm -hmm. And once they've got that, they can then have free services with a psychologist, etc. So I'd say if, if, if you can't find anything in your local community, go to your doctor because they will know how to get a mental health plan and where the services are available. Okay. I'll just remind listeners that they're on 4DDB, which is Community Radio 102.7 FM, and we're on the segment called Big Little Small Talk, and we're talking to a lovely woman called <laughs> Marilyn Strafer. She's rolling her eyes. <laughs> she is a lovely woman. But we're just in the, in the midst of hearing about her work, and it's really important work too. So, Marilyn... You, at the moment, are the CEO of the PHN, the Primary Health Network, mm. for Darling Downs and West Morton. And can you explain to the listeners what exactly the PHN is and mm. where, how it was established, why it was established, and what its main charter is, and how mm. big is your area? Mm. So um, Primary Health Networks are an Australian government initiative. They're, they're funded by the Commonwealth Department of Health. There's 31 regions in Australia and in, in a nutshell, our job is to try and keep people as well as possible in the community so they're not using the hospital system. That's in a nutshell. But there's seven priorities. So we, we try and make sure that people who would normally have difficulty accessing the health system have the services that they need. So Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, people who are aged, um, people with disabilities, what we call population health. So they're people with chronic diseases like diabetes, etc. Uh, we're interested in health workforce, like how do we get people to go to rural areas. Um, we also look after digital health, so my health record, um, you know, looking at how you can get electronic prescriptions, all of those sorts of things. And then it's mental health and alcohol and other drugs. So they're our, our key priorities that are given to us by the Australian government. And we're what they call a commissioner of services. So we actually don't directly see people in the community, but we fund services like Lifeline, like Beyond Blue. So you will have heard of all of those services. We're the funder of those services. Um, and we probably have about $35 million a year that we put into the local health economy. And that area is West Morton, so that's Ipswich and Surrounds, and then Darling Downs Health, which is Toowoomba, out to Chinchilla, and down to Gundawindi. So it's quite a big area. Okay, and um, I, I, that was great that you told me about um, those seven different key areas. I didn't realise that it was kind of broken down into those. So just this morning I'm driving to work and I hear about the Bush Fax bus. Tell me about that. That's obviously wow. fitting into some category of what you're doing. We, we have an amazing team who have broken all records in terms of vaccination. So you will have seen that Gundawindi's got some of the highest vaccination numbers in, in the, the state. country. Oh, in the country, yeah. In the country. And part of that, you know, as I said, we've got this wonderful team. So we knew that we had a lot of little places like John Darien, Tara, um, Bri Maru, Kinkillenbun, I can't get my tongue around that one. But in you know, all these little places where, where we knew that the vaccine numbers were low and we figured that it was because people had difficulty accessing a GP or a pharmacist. So the bus is turning up on their doorstep. Every day um, there'll be a different location and people can go and get their needle and then we'll be back in three weeks so they can get the follow-up. So yesterday in Inglewood, for example, now Inglewood's a place we have been to five times already to vaccinate people, and yet we still did 70 new vaccinations yesterday. So, which is great because, you know, the, the story that 
that we want people to understand is that Queensland is going to open its borders in a few weeks and we won't have any choice as to where people travel in Queensland. So it's quite likely that we will get grey nomads, for example, going even into those little rural areas. If one of those is COVID positive, that presents an enormous problem for that community. Now, we, we won't get 100% prevention of COVID with a double vaccination, but we sure get at least a 70 to 80% reduction and we reduce transmission to other people as well. And hopefully um, for people that are double vaxxed, they, they won't get, even if they do get COVID, we hope that they'll be able to stay out of hospital. And that's the big thing, isn't it? The stress mm. that it's going to put on the hospital system. I'm ashamed to say that I've got that really hard demographic to reach, which is the young males in their 20s who think, well, I'm not getting COVID, I'm not getting sick because I'm well and healthy. Mm. They're my kids. So how do you reach them? Look, you know, this is the problem. When, when you're in your 20s and 30s, you do think you're bulletproof and they're not. You know, I, I wish that they could see what's been happening in New South Wales and Victoria because you've got young men gasping for breath, you've got young men on oxygen, you've got young men intubated. Um, and it's not just, once you get over that, it's not just a bad flu. This can last for months. It, we, it may even last for years. Mm. Long COVID is still telling us its story. It causes, it can cause erectile dysfunction. Tell that to your young men. Um, you know, that, that's, that's part of what we, we've got to be really honest and whatever it takes. I know that my son would be worried if he thought that that was going to be an issue and he's double vaxxed. So, you know, just please, if, if, if you're not doing it for yourself, at least do it for your family, mm. for your granny, for the lady down the road. And I think that's where the messaging has been missing a little bit it's not actually about you it's about the rest of the community and that's how vaccination works it works for the other people in the community and um, I, I've heard something that the long um, COVID talks it's sort of like Ross River fever it's mm. all of that unexplained fatigue, uh, fatigue yeah. and just can't quite get right mm. and you know and that just goes on and on mm. and on but what I can't understand is I always say if someone said look there's this thing that could kill you but we've got this other mm. thing that could that you could avoid it mm. you'd reckon people would be beating on the door saying well, it, it's a funny phenomenon because we have for every other disease you know people are quite happy to get their tetanus injections quite happy to even get a flu injection every year and yet for some reason, you know, we've, we've got all these Dr. Googles now who think that they know better than the best scientists in the world. Mm. And uh, it worries me. But what I do hold out hope for, I know, you know, Australians, it's all about mateship and, and helping each other. And we saw that, you know, remember the first Anzac Day when we were all locked down and, you know, people went to the end Stood of their up, driveways yeah. and that. But they really observed that lockdown because we wanted to contain it. We didn't have a vaccine then. We wanted to not let it get into our nursing homes. And you know, Queensland didn't have one death in a nursing home, which is just mm. remarkable. Why don't we harness that sort of sentiment mm. that we had then mm. for our vaccination? It's no different. Mm. You know, like I said, it's not just about you. It's about your family, your neighbours, etc. Mm. And, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if Queensland could get up to 90, 95% double vaxxed? Mm. Like, um, what's happening, Marilyn, with people who are uh, unable? What, what's um, unable to get a vaccination for medical reasons? Are they able to get a certificate or what, what happens yeah, with them? there's a medical exemption. Okay. And, and, you know, I was just talking to a lady the other day um, who was for you know, various health reasons, um, is unable to get vaccinated. And unfortunately, what will happen is that um, those people will have to just keep themselves safe once the, the, the borders are opened up. You know, they'll mm. have to continue to wear masks and avoid crowds mm. and things like that. And what about, say, if they want to travel and it's um, mandatory that you have to have been vaccinated and to show that you've been vaccinated, will, do you think, you may not know the answer mm. to this, but 
that they or say even to go across the border do you think that that will they will all go into certain restaurants or go um, to shows or something will mm. will it will they be precluded do you yeah, know look I don't know the answer to that um, I, what I know at the moment is is yes they would be um, but I don't you know, I'm not a I'm not in a public health unit, so I, I can't comment on that. But at the moment, everything points to having to be double vaccinated in order to have some of those freedoms. Mm. So um, I don't know what the story is mm. in terms of that. What's your view on um, the booster shot? So people being able to um, I'm not saying whether you think that it's effective or not. Part of me really struggles with that some people in the world have not been vaccinated at all mm. and yet mm. we're sort of living this privileged life where mm. we're almost up to a stage where we can get a booster shot. Mm. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing. I have a friend who um, is a consultant to the World Bank and she was telling me the other day she was meeting, you know, with various people from various countries, India, etc. And she was explaining to them about vaccine hesitancy. And they were saying to her, so you've got, you've got the vaccine and yet you still have people who don't want the vaccine? They could not get their head around it because mm. they don't even have access to that first vaccine. What we know about the, the vaccine is that after about five to six months, it does start to lose a bit of its potency and a bit of its coverage. Not enormously, mm. but if you wanted to be really well protected they do advise a booster shot five to six months after your last dose too so from from now really anyone who presents to their medico asking for a booster shot will be given one right right, right. um now marilyn we'll just go off the um vaccines for a little bit and you started to say before that part of the work that the phn does is um about a skills shortage so i know you've got different things you've got campaigns you've got events um and part of your campaign one of your campaigns is trying to do something about the Twim toowoomba is it only medical skills shortage tell me about that no um we've got a shortage across the board in health so we've got a shortage you know in nursing staff um, doctors but also allied health so we are looking at how we can attract people to our region, um, particularly medicos, like the old days where you had a general practice in a little tiny town and, you know, you stayed there forever. Um, it's just not attractive for a lot of families anymore, you know, to go to those places. So we have to look at what we can do to, you know, make it an attractive proposition. So things like looking at housing you know, for those workers, um, looking at employment for their spouses as well, making sure that the children have access to good schools. They're all the things that people are starting to talk about, you know, and, and that might make it more attractive to get people mm. in those locations. So what's the PHN doing specifically? Is it sort of um, making up a prospectus of places to live mm. and what the advantages are or are they... You know, how does it work, yeah, really? Yeah, so I'll take it an example with the South Burnett, so around Kingaroy. That, that's been, that was an issue to attract um, GPs with obstetrics experience, etc. And we made it the community's problem. So we got the local council involved, we got some health consumers, we had the hospital leadership and we had primary care at the table. And we've looked at, you know, what are all the different ways that we can attract people to the South Burnett. And there's been some really innovative stuff that's come out of that to a point where the workforce has pretty much stabilised in that area. And we're now doing that in Milmerin and Chinchilla using an ESC, using a very similar model where we... We involve the local council and, you know, as leaders in that community and they they know everybody, you know, they know all the vacant buildings and, and all that sort of thing and getting them involved with mm -hmm. us. Uh, I know um, we talk at the moment, there's a lot of talk about the housing shortage and, um, and part of that is driven by people moving out of 
um, Sydney and Melbourne and coming to the regions. Have you found that, have you noticed that or is that just more anecdotal, do you think? No, I think, you know, my daughter's a living, breathing example. Um, her and her husband, what one of the advantages they found in COVID because they lived in in Brisbane, he works in aviation and she works as an occupational therapist. When they were working from home, um, their employer said, well, you can continue to work from home, you know, after COVID. And they said, well, even from Toowoomba? And they said, yes. So they were able to move to Toowoomba, cheaper housing compared to Brisbane, great schools for the children, and, you know, a really nice lifestyle. So they're really happy you know, oh, that living. sounds ideal. Yeah. And I, look, if I, I'm, not, I'm not a soothsayer, but if I was, I'd say they're going to start a family soon. Or they have. Oh, they have already. In fact, there's one due in three weeks. <laughs> oh, there you, you are. Know, I'm a very good predictor. So, <laughs> That's we, right. You know, snuggly nights in winter. Everyone so, comes home. I think we're a case yeah, in point. And we yeah, can, and yeah, yeah, you know, why wouldn't you want to live up here? It's beautiful. Oh, it's an enviable lifestyle. And the value for money property-wise, it's still so affordable. Mm. And as you say, we have lots of really good schools, um, private and public, mm. and um, and a, the beautiful lack of traffic, of course, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. drives you mad as soon as you hit Brisbane, mm. isn't it? And the love, you know, the weather. It's... Well, we always talk about we we don't have a beach, we don't have um, something. I think is that the chooks, no, <laughs> the <a> dog. dogs. <laughs> uh, we don't have a beach, but what our what our unique feature is is our climate. Mm. So our warm temperate climate and our garden city so we need to really retain mm. that the the that that's our point of difference is our green our canopy and all the beautiful things that that offers in terms of temperature mm. and all of that so We've i'm got glad a beautiful to hear theater yeah. where you can park across the road from the theater uh, we've got lovely shops but if you want to go to brisbane or the coast mm. you know it's, it's just yeah, a short drive yeah. away and but it, it's funny that you say that about the skills shortage and it has always been hasn't it so Marilyn you mentioned before about some of the projects that you support and I did want to particularly ask you about the Okies um, the youth support program out there can you because I have had a little bit to do with it can you just tell me about that and and <clears throat> the aims of the project and what the PHN did and where you are up to with it now yeah, well, that originally came out of the the PFAS crisis that, that Oki found itself in. Um, as you know, aviation foam had caused, you know, some chemical runoff in, into the town. And not only did that affect people's mental health, as you know, in terms of they were worried about the long-term um, implications of that, but also property um, prices at the time went down, so that, you know, caused people to worry as well. And we knew that, so we offered, you know, blood testing, you know, for PFAS as part of that service, and we also offered support to the community to help them get through that. And one of the areas that we knew we needed to concentrate on was young people and make sure that they had some support during this as well. Because, you know, if their parents were worried, the, the odds were that that was going to also cause issues for the young people. So we did a variety of things, but the best thing we did was work with council um, to put in place uh, basically a youth worker um, into Oki who looks at, you know, what, what community... Um, services can be put in place to support young people but also to make sure that those young people have access to the right support services should they need them mm. and it's you know it's been a lovely project. Mm. So what sort of things did they do? I know that there was a box off the streets uh, program that the lovely Julie Cave was running. Yes, um, yes. Julie Cave is the worker that was. Yes, yes Julie's been wonderful. Um, They've done a variety of things, so everything from sort of um, discos, you know, just to get the kids out and, and, and having a good time, but also looking um, for kids from an Aboriginal background, looking that they've got a connection to culture and, and country as well, um, right through to, you know, children with, with, you know, challenging mental health issues, making sure that they've got, you know, the right supports um, around them. Mm. Um, so Julie's done a, some great work in understanding their particular needs 
of that community and then putting support services around that are targeted at those mm. needs. I think one of the things I heard Julie speak one time and I think the thing that I really, really liked about what she said and it really resonated was I'm not here to provide entertainment for these kids. I'm here to empower this community to look after each other. And, and that was such a powerful thing for her to say, you know, it's not just mm. one of those things we blow in and then we blow back out again and no. then it's all gone back to the same sort of thing. Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, what you want those kids to learn is resilience. So it's around how to deal with setbacks, you know, how to work through a sad day, um, how to understand you know, what your emotions are doing and, and what to do about it when you do feel sad. Um, they're really, really important life skills. Mm, well, that was one of the things that you brought up very early in this interview, exactly mm. the same thing. Yeah. yeah. So I'll just go back to quickly. You, you started out as a speech pathologist mm. when you first came out of uni. Mm. Where did you grow up? Around? So I grew up in Bowen in North Queensland, so home of mangoes and tomatoes <laughs> and the wet Sundays. So I had a pretty idyllic childhood, sailing boats and fishing and things, and went to Brisbane for uni. Um, had, had no idea. Had your parents been to uni or were they no, farmers? No, or what no, were they? My now? dad was a farmer and my mother was a librarian and um, had six children. Um, their belief was that education was the key to everything. So we were all strongly encouraged to go to university. I was the youngest. Um, and I didn't even know what a speech therapist did. I knew that I was good at science and English and it seemed like a nice um, combination. How did so, you know about speech therapy? Can you remember that one Only from person? the guidance officer. You looked through, the, oh, the guidance you know, officer. The you guidance, didn't look through the, the QTAC yeah, book and yeah, think, the mm -hmm. yeah, I'm going to be the... the, the uh, and, and, you know, I thought, oh, well, that sounds like... Because mum, right. mum had also been a speech and drama teacher. So I sort of had that, you know, as well. And um, my first posting, I really wanted a hospital job. And it was either Charters Towers Hospital or Mount Isa Hospital. And I went to Charters Towers Hospital, having never been there before in my life. Um, and that's where I met my husband. And um, it was... It was a lovely place to work. And then he decided he wanted to join the police service. So we moved. What was to... he doing before that? He was a diesel fitter, but his dad was a detective. So they said he had to get a trade before he was allowed to, <laughs> to be a police officer. So we went back to Brisbane and then we were, um, then I was transferred to Townsville. Um, I was the first country speech therapist in charge with the education department. So I looked after all the North Queensland speech therapists at the age of 22. <laughs> Did you get much an respect from them? Um, <laughs> no, no, not much it's respect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty tricky. And then, um, then I joined the Commonwealth as uh, in the Commonwealth Rehabilitation Service. And that's where I worked with acquired brain injury and I loved it. I, I did that for years and years and years. And um, when we, um, we had our first child in Townsville and then we were transferred to Bowen and that's where we had our second child and then... Back home. And your mum and dad still there my, when, you, were, when my, you went my there? My dad was. Yeah, I lost my mum quite early um, before I had children. And um, then we moved to Brisbane and then we moved to Toowoomba. And, right. Yeah. And both of you... What what role did you say your husband, he got, he was the... So he was detective inspector when he's retired at the end of last year. So we, we've always had a fairly busy life and our children have learnt to be very independent. Resilient. Resilient. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, like for the first probably 10 years of our marriage when the children were little, it was like being a single parent because... He was a fairly junior detective then and, you know, he would sit off drug crops for weeks at a time and and things like that. And they were the days when he didn't even have mobile phones, so you just sort of hoped and prayed he'd be okay. And when he was, um, he was one of two detectives when we moved to Bowen and so anything bad that happened, like a siege or, or anything, you know, he was front and centre. 
And there were many times when I was handling the phone calls and calling on people to bring rifles and vests and things like that and hoping and praying he was going to be okay. And, you know, we had a couple of cyclones and he would go off in the middle of that to rescue other people and leave me home with the children, you know, terrified. But um, that's, that's just how it was. And Marilyn, it's just so interesting that you were kind of on this the social services side of um, child protection, I guess, and he was on the other side, possibly arresting some of these kids yeah. or probably we've gone a bit past that by then. But um, did you clash over your views, your yeah, world views? Or? Yeah, yeah, I think we've, we've had some healthy debates. <laughs> um, he's very, he's a, you know, police are black and white. So you're either guilty or you're not. Whereas I'm shades of grey, it's... You know, look at what the story is behind and what could have happened to arrest this trajectory and things like that. Having said that, um, the police that I've worked with in child protection, and he was the head of child protection for Toowoomba for many years, um, they are great people. And, you know, you can find better souls than those people. Many times we've had babies brought home to our house by my husband um, where we would bath them and change them and feed them, you know, because there was nowhere for them to go at three o'clock in the morning. Um, and, you know, these these big burly coppers who'd be there changing little kids' nappies and things like that, like, you know, that's the stuff the public doesn't see. And, and yes, while we may have disagreed, you know, we also had some really funny intersections where I'd be on the phone and he'd be on the phone. We're actually talking about the same, you know, family. Um, so, you know, solving the problems of the world from our armchair. Yeah, truly, <laughs> truly, truly incredible. I'll just remind the listeners that they're on 40DB, 102.7 FM, and we're on Big Little Small Talk, a segment where we get talk to someone in the community and we're talking to Marilyn Strofield who is the retiring CEO from the PHN. We're at a different stage in our career and our life and where we're going to move to. Just before we finish up, I want to talk to you about uh, voluntary assisted dying and your experience um, and your beliefs there, Marilyn, because um, I know you were quite public about it last year when the legislation was coming through. So can you explain to me and to the listeners how, how you came to... What, what your beliefs are and how you came to believe what you believe. Yeah, yeah. look, um, it, it's a sad story, but it's a fairly common story that when I was 24, my beautiful mum was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and um, it, it was only six weeks from diagnosis to when she passed away, but it was six horrific weeks. And I won't go into all the details, but they are on the public record. And, uh, you know, it, it was at the point where this beautiful, gentle woman was begging to be shot, um, you know, to, to be helped. And um, it just didn't seem right that, that, that people had to go through that, particularly when you didn't have any hope of survival. You knew that, you know, you were going to die. And, and mum, mum's a really strong Anglican, like, you know, she she believed in God and, and all of those things, but she still also believed that he wouldn't want that level of suffering. And then um, if you roll on then, you know, 35 years later to um, my brother-in-law had lymphoma and um, he only passed away the year before last and once again, a horrible last few weeks. Um, and then my, my own brother had a brain tumour. Um, yes, yeah, sad story. Um, passed away in my beautiful brother, John, um, who I was really close to. And he passed away in January this year. And it was, uh, it's a horrible way to die. And, you know, I think we accept, we accept everybody has to die at some point but I don't think you have to suffer unnecessarily if there is the means to help you whether that be a whole lot of pain relief or or whatever and people seem to make it like a, a struggle between palliative care and voluntary assisted dying I actually think both are beautiful things like I work really closely with people who deliver palliative care and you know, they are some of the loveliest people you could ever meet. They, they have access to great drugs who, you know, really 
can help deal with pain levels, etc. But there are a cohort of people, and unfortunately my family members fell into that because they were in hospital. They didn't have access to really good palliative care. And as a result, they, they really suffered. And I think, you know, the saddest thing is, is watching young adult children witness that. Um, it's something that touches you forever. And if I could take away that pain from my nieces and nephews, I would. And I was really disappointed that some of the local politicians didn't support it. And I wonder whether that was a true conscience decision or whether they just thought they needed to go against it because it was a government bill. I think that would be really sad mm. if that was the case. But I did, you know, I, I tried to get my story out there through the Go Gently campaign, which is Andrew Denton's um, uh, charity. And, uh, you know, the story. And, and, you know, regardless of what your political beliefs are, the, the, the night that that was announced, I... I sent a personal message to the attorney, Shannon Vanneman, just to say thank you. Mm. And I think, um, I think there'd be a lot of people who feel yeah. the same way. And I, I suppose the thing that uh, I always think is, unless you've been through it, don't judge other people for it. No, it's, um... and, and, you know, even, even the religious uh, views on it, um, my mother could reconcile her beliefs with, being assisted to die and and her beliefs were that she believed in a loving and and compassionate god Mm -hmm. and why wouldn't if if god created the means for you not to suffer then why wouldn't she be able to access that Mm -hmm. you know if if Mm -hmm. you were making Mm -hmm. the decision Mm -hmm. so yeah i i think that Mm. And I think um, I really admired you for that, Marilyn, because I think sometimes when you're in a very public job, you um, are very cautious about what you have, what you can say, and you sometimes sort of walk the middle line. But I think sometimes we only have a voice for a small amount of time, and we need to use it for the things that we really believe in. And um, yeah, I really believe that. Um, I, I, I have told the story before, um, and listeners might have heard this before, my own mother died of lung cancer and um, she did a health directive very early in her, into her illness and she said, keep me alive at any cost, which really surprised us. We were sort of thinking mm. that she would go the voluntary assisted mm. dying every day mm. of the week, but she didn't. She didn't want that. So mm. that was really interesting mm. because we as her daughters thought that we knew what she would have yeah. wanted and she yeah. didn't want that. Yeah. So, But she didn't have the choice, you know, yeah. and... I want to have the choice. Yeah, so. absolutely. And, you know, it, it's it's used rarely and it, it's when people have absolutely no hope of survival. It's not like when you've just, you know, had a stroke and it's hard going and you will get better. This mm. is when you're going to die within weeks. But, mm. you know, they're yeah. going to make you go through all this horrible pain. Yeah, that's right, exactly. Well, look, I'm just about running out of time, but I do like to throw a... Um, a couple of curly questions mm-hmm. at the people that I interview. And yours, Marilyn, is what's the biggest risk you've ever taken? Now, hearing your story, I reckon you've probably <laughs> taken a few. But uh, I think probably the biggest risk was accepting the Deputy Director General job, knowing that I would be responsible for reforming child safety after some very high-profile tragic deaths of children and but I really I think my passion to make a difference and to do the right thing overrode my fear of of whether I'd be strong enough to do that and Mm. it was and it was exactly that's right oh well I think I th- it's all you know it goes to all of that stuff about women thinking that they're up for the job and Always. all of that so that's another whole um interview but um I'm going to ask you now because you look like someone who'd love to have fun what's the song that can't keep you off the dance floor well I'm an old Akadaka fan <laughs> so anything Akadaka you, you know you shook me all night long <laughs> TNT I'm a bit of a muso and so I love like a in my youth, I played in a punk rock band, so there you go. And I still love to get the guitar out and, you know, have a bit of a, 
a jam. So yeah, anything Gaga Daka. But the sentimental side of me would say Knocking on Heaven's Door by Bob Dylan was the first slow dance I ever had with my husband. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that as well. Oh, I want to see a photo of you in the punk. Um, oh, I usually try and put a photo um, up for the Facebook so that we can advertise that the, yeah, the interview's coming up. It's not sweet? It's probably best not. Not, right. not to yeah. see it. Okay. All right. So I think some of the listeners know that my guilty pleasure is that I love spying on the royals and not spying, <laughs> tracking them down on Instagram <laughs> late at night, just watching video after video. So can I ask you, who is your favourite royal and why? Do you know, it has to be the Queen. And I will say, be, it, look, regardless of whether she's a Queen and regardless of whether people are monarchists or whatever, to be still working as hard as she is at 95 is quite remarkable. And, you know, she has been a diplomat for 70 years. Now, most people only get a 20-year stint at at most. Um, she has been, you know, bringing people together, making sure that, you know, she's on top of all the political situations across the Commonwealth for 70 years. And here she is in Glasgow, even though she's been crook, still popping up and saying, hey, let's save the planet. Let's, you know, worry about climate change. And it's like, you go, Queen Elizabeth. Oh, I love that because I did hear, hear, hear her this morning and she's been unwell. She can't get mm. there, but she did the video for mm. them and said, you know, we need to really worry about this. Mm. You need to take this seriously. Mm. You need to work it out, work it out, mm. guys and women. Yeah. So, yeah, I, um, I think know, Queen Elizabeth's a very good choice. She yeah. could have ridden off into the sunset and, you know, she lost her husband. and But she hasn't. She's just persevered she's put up with an annoying grandson who's you know doing silly things oh, and oh that might be a discussion <laughs> for another day but um yeah but, <laughs> but, but you know, I, I, I love your choice yeah, yeah yeah Marilyn can I thank you sincerely for your candidness and your honesty your humility um Thanks, it's been Megan. a really really wonderful interview thank, thank you. you I've enjoyed thank it you. Too. thank you That's it for this week. Thanks for joining me on Big Little Small Talk. I hope you can make the time to join me next week. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on your favourite podcast app.